In the 1930s, America went through hard times. The collapse of the stock market and the depression that followed left many people struggling. In this insecure atmosphere, workers in the automobile industry sought more job security. The desire for a union representing the interests of the rank and file grew through the decade. One of the early leaders of the United Auto Workers was Walter Ruther. He was very much uh, an idealist, uh, but I think also was a very practical judge of people and of uh, situations. Uh, he, he was really very good at uh, maneuvering his, his own people and the opposition. The UAW's first major maneuver took place in January 1937. The target was General Motors. The place was an engine plant in Flint, Michigan that produced motors for nearly all GM models. The tactics were unusual. Instead of organizing outside the plant, the workers engineered the first sit-down strike. At the end of a shift, when the workers would normally leave, they would just not leave. And sometimes some of, their other, uh, some of the other workers would then join them. And they would basically live inside the plant. Within six weeks, the Flint sit-down strike shut down General Motors. The company became the first to sign a contract with the UAW. Similar sit-downs were taking place at Chrysler, and within six months of the GM signing, Walter Chrysler himself signed a contract with the union. With two of the big three on board, many thought Ford would soon follow suit. But in 1937, Henry Ford was in no mood to make a deal. I think for Henry Ford, it, it came down to an issue of control. It was his company. He, by that time, he had bought out all his stockholders, and he and Edsel owned the company lock, stock, and barrel. And he didn't want anybody telling him how to run his company. And he, and, and he felt the union was trying to, to, to do that. Confrontations became violent. When Walter Ruther and other union organizers were handing out leaflets to workers near a pedestrian overpass near Detroit, Ford's security squad attacked. Unfortunately for Ford, the entire scene was captured by a news photographer. Images of the Battle of the Overpass appeared in newspapers across the country. But it took another four years for Henry Ford to allow union elections. The greatest pressure came from his own family. Ford's daughter-in-law, Eleanor, and his wife, Clara, threatened to sell their Ford stock if Henry didn't recognize the workers. While one conflict was ending at home, another was exploding overseas. Then, on December 7, 1941, came the news flash that stunned our nation. We were at war. The onset of World War II brought major changes to the automobile industry. Suddenly, the federal government needed massive amounts of military hardware in a hurry and Detroit was the natural place to go for manufacturing know-how. The things that were made one at a time all during World War I and, and time after were now being geared up to be produced you know, like an automobile. And who better to, to start that effort than the automobile companies? By March 1942, the federal government ordered the Big Three to halt all production of civilian cars. For Chrysler, the challenge was to build a tank arsenal in Warren, Michigan. Before the building of that plant, the United States uh, had almost no uh, tank building capabilities. And this plant was uh, built and put into operation, uh, I think, in less than a year's time. Chrysler's manufacturing miracles got the attention of President Franklin Roosevelt, who was given a tour of the tank plant by company president K.T. Keller. The company also produced tons of ammunition, anti-aircraft cannons, bomber planes, gyroscopes, and a long line of military trucks. With all this production, one vehicle would emerge from the war with a reputation like no other, a four-wheel drive vehicle originally produced by the Willis Overland Company of Toledo. They called it the Jeep. In fact, the, the GIs coming back uh, after experiencing what a, a Jeep could do, uh, what that type of vehicle could do, wanted, uh, wanted to have something like that. But the Jeep was really a rarity, one of the few wartime products to find a home in post-war America. In 1945, with victory at hand, the automakers were eager to get back to what they knew best, building cars. Next on the Chrysler Chronicles, a new revolution. As America enters the 1950s, its love affair with the automobile starts all over again. Coming soon on CEM. <laughs>